Judaism prohibits any form of idolatry. According to this understanding, even if one directs worship to God and not to a statue, picture, or some other created thing, but uses a created thing as a representation of God in order to assist in his worship, this is also considered a form of idolatry. In fact, Maimonides explains in chapter 1 of Avodat Chopavim in the Mishnah Torah that this is one of the ways that idolatry began. During the times of Enosh, mankind made a great mistake, and the wise men of that generation gave thoughtless counsel. Enosh himself was one of those who erred. Their mistake was as follows. They said God created stars and spheres with which to control the world. He placed them on high and treated them with honor, making them servants who minister before him. Accordingly, it is fitting to praise and glorify them and to treat them with honor. They perceived this to be the will of God, blessed be he, that they may magnify and honor those whom he magnified and honored, just as a king desires that the servants who stand before him be honored. Indeed, doing so is an expression of honor to the king. Maimonides was the most thorough in his elucidation of monotheism and the problems of idolatry. This is seen in his work known as Mishnah Torah, in the Guide for the Perplexed, and in very shorter writings he composed. In the Mishnah Torah, the theme of proclaiming the unity of the Creator and eradication of idolatry is not limited to the section specified for these topics. Rather, it permeates every section of the work as the purpose and the foundation of the entire Torah. In the Guide for the Perplexed, Maimonides so clarifies his understanding of monotheism and idolatry that in its light even certain Jewish communities of his time and today become suspect of idolatry. This was the core reason for his controversy, even more so than the issue of philosophy. For it is the principal object of the law and the axis round which it turns to blot out these opinions from man's heart and make the existence of idolatry impossible. As regards the former, Scripture said, Lest your heart be persuaded, etc., whose heart turns away today, etc. The actual abolition of idolatry is expressed in the following passage. You shall destroy their altars and burn their groves in fire, and you shall destroy their name, etc. These two things are frequently repeated. They form the principal and first object of the whole law, as our sages distinctly told us in their traditional explanation of the words, All that God command you by the hand of Moses. For they say, Hence we learn that those who follow idolatry deny, as it were, their adhesion to the whole law, and those who reject idolatry follow, as it were, the whole law. In order that we may keep far from all kinds of witchcraft, we are warned not to adopt any of the practices of the idolaters, even such as are connected with agriculture, the keeping of cattle, and similar work. The law prohibits everything the idolaters, according to their doctrine and contrary to reason, consider as being useful and acting in the manner of certain mysterious forces. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances, and you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. Our sages call such acts the ways of the Amorite. They are kinds of witchcraft which they are not arrived at by reason, but are similar to the performances of witchcraft, which is necessarily connected with the influences of the stars. Thus, the manners of the nations lead people to extol, worship, and praise the star. All images are prohibited because they are worshipped once a year, such as the statement of Rabbi Meir. But the sages declare, an image is not prohibited except one that has a staff or a bird or orb in its hand. Rabban Simeon B. Gamliel says, Also any image which has anything in its hand is prohibited. It was during the time of Enosh that mankind began to make great mistakes, and the wise men of the generation of Enosh gave thoughtless counsel. Enosh was one of those who erred. 
And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then to call on the name of God became profaned. Genesis 4, verse 26. Rabbi Chia ben Abba said in Rabbi Yohanan's name, He who observes the Sabbath according to its laws, even if he practices idolatry, like the generation of Enosh, is forgiven, for it is said, Blessed is Enosthat does this that keeps the Sabbath Meholelo from profaning it. Read not Meholelo, but Mehul, lo, he is forgiven. This generation knew that God created the stars and spheres, and he placed them on high and treated them with honor, making them ministers before God. God said, Let there be luminaries in the firmament of the heaven to separate the day and night, and they shall serve as signs and as for festivals and for days and years, and they shall serve as luminaries in the firmament of the heaven to shine upon the earth. And it was. And God made the two great luminaries, the greater luminary to dominate the day, and the lesser luminary dominate the night, and the stars. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, to dominate by day and by night, and to separate between the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. Genesis 1 verses 14 through 19. According to the wise of the generation of Enosh, it was only fitting to glorify the luminaries and treat them with honor. They saw this as God's will, that the luminaries should be magnified and honored. They reasoned that just as a king would desire his servants who stand before him be honored, so should be the servants, the luminaries, be honored before God, the king of all. In response to this line of thinking, the generation of Enosh began to construct temples to the stars and offer sacrifices to them. They would praise and glorify the stars and prostrate themselves before them because they believed this was God's will. This was the rationale at the outset of the worshipping of things other than God himself. Even though some question whether the worship by idols pertains to non-Jews, it is Maimonides' view that worshipping idols is forbidden for non-Jews. A Gentile who worships false gods is liable, provided he worships them in an accepted manner. A Gentile is executed for every type of foreign worship which a Jewish court would consider worthy of capital punishment. However, a Gentile is not executed for a type of foreign worship which a Jewish court would not deem worthy of capital punishment. Nevertheless, even though a Gentile will not be executed for these forms of worship, he is forbidden to engage in all of them. We should not allow them to erect a monument, or to plant an asherah, or to make images, and the like, even though they are only for the sake of beauty. Many years passed, and false prophets arose who began to tell the nations that God commanded them to tell the people to serve a particular star, or all the stars, with sacrifices, libations, temples, and images. Initially, only individuals worshipped in this manner. But there were now false prophets who rose up, and through false prophecies commanded everyone, man, woman, and child, to worship the stars in this manner. Idolatry was instituted by the leader of the nations in an attempt to unite the people of a particular land. Idolatry was used to give the people a national identity as well as establishing a hierarchy of leaders. All the above manners are falsehood and lies with which the original idolaters deceived the Gentile nations in order to lead them after them. The false prophet would inform the people of a particular image that he supposedly received in a prophetic vision. He would tell the people that the image is of a particular star. The people would then begin making the image and placing it in temples, under specific trees, and on the mountaintops and hilltops. These idols brought the distant stars into the realm of the people who were worshipping them. Prophets were used to offer direction for what the idols should look like in order to represent the star that was being worshipped. It is known that idolaters selected the highest possible places on high mountains where to build their temples and to place their images. 
It is known that the heathen in those days built temples to stars and set up in those temples the image which they agreed upon to worship, because it was in some relation to a certain star or to a portion of one of the spheres. The false prophets would tell the people that it is proper to worship the idols because the idols are the source of benefit or harm. If the people would only listen to the false prophets and follow their instructions, the idols would grant success to the people. More false prophets continued to rise and declare that a specific star, sphere, or angel had spoken to them. These false prophets stated that the specific star, sphere, or angel instructed them on how the people were to worship them. The false prophets would then pass this mode of service on to the people and instruct them in the ways of a particular idol. These idolatrous practices spread across the entire world, and people would serve these idols with foreign practices. As the years passed, God's name was forgotten by the entire world's population. Everyone only knew of the idol that he or she was brought up knowing and whom he or she served. By worshiping these idols, the people abandoned one of the mitzvot given to Adam, to worship only God. Even the wise among the people did not know God existed. They only knew of the stars and spheres for which they had images. God was not recognized by any except the very select few, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, Shem, and Eber. The world would continue worshiping the idols and forgetting God until Abraham was born. Abraham knew that the entire world was erring in their idolatrous practices. Their service of the stars and images made them lose awareness of God and the ultimate truth that God is the Creator and the only God. Abraham was 40 years old when he became aware of God. As a response, Abraham began to formulate replies to the people in ur and debate them. Abraham informed these idolaters that they were not following a proper path. Abraham recognized God in his own. He had no teacher. God said to him, You have made my name known in the world. Upon your life I give you possession of the heavenly and the earthly. Abraham broke their idols and began to teach the people that it is only proper to serve God, the creator and master of the world. It is only fitting to bow down, offer libations, and sacrifice to God, so that the generations of the future would recognize God. It is also fitting to destroy all the idolatrous images so people would not err and worship them as if they were gods. Terah manufactured idols. One day he went on a trip and left Abraham to sell them in his place. When someone came to buy, Abraham would ask, How old are you? The customer would answer that he was fifty or sixty years old. Woe to this man, Abraham would say. He is sixty years old, yet he wants to bow down to a one-day-old idol. The man would go away in shame. A woman came in carrying a bowl of flour. She said to Abraham, Take this and offer it before the idols. He took a stick, broke all the idols, and placed the stick in the hand of the biggest one. When his father came, he asked, Who did this to them? Why should I hide it from you? replied Abraham. A woman came in carrying a bowl of flour and said to me, Offer this before the idols. So I offered it before them. This one said, I will eat first, and that one said, I will eat first. The biggest one took a stick and broke the rest. Why are you fooling me, said Tara? Do idols have understanding? Abraham replied, Let your ears hear what your mouth is saying. Since Abraham overcame the idolaters through the strength of his arguments, King Nimrod desired to kill him. Tara took him and handed him over to Nimrod. Nimrod said to Abraham, Bow down to the fire. If so, said Abraham, Shall we bow down to the water which extinguishes fire? Bow down to water. If so, shall we bow down to the clouds which carry water? Bow down to the cloud. If so, shall we bow down to the wind which scatters the clouds? Bow down to the wind. And shall we bow down to the man who contains the wind? Nimrod said to him, You are talking empty words. I bow down only to fire. Now I shall throw you into it, and let the God to whom you bowed come and save you. However, Abraham was saved through a miracle and left for Haran. 
the wicked Nimrod cast our father Abraham into the fiery furnace, Gabriel said to the Holy One, Blessed be he, Sovereign of the universe, let me go down, cool it, and deliver that righteous man from the fiery furnace. Said the Holy One, Blessed be to him, I am unique in my world, and he is unique in his world. It is fitting for him who is unique to deliver him who is unique. And it was when Nimrod had cast Abram into the furnace of fire because he would not worship his idol, and the fire had no power to burn him, that Haran's heart was became doubtful, saying, If Nimrod overcome, I will be on his side, but if Abram overcome, I will be on his side. While in Haran, he called in a loud voice to all the people and informed them that there is only one God and it is proper to serve only him. He gathered the people in city and country until he came to the land of Canaan, proclaiming God's name the entire time he traveled. He planted in Eshel and Beersheba, and there he proclaimed the name of God, God of the universe. Genesis 21 verse 33 and he called there the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Rish Lakish said, Read not, and he called, but, and he made to call. Thereby teaching that our father Abraham caused the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, to be uttered by the mouth of every passerby. How was this? After travelers had eaten and drunk, they stood up to bless him. But said he to them, Did you eat of mine? You ate of that which belongs to the God of the universe. Thank, praise, and bless him who spoke, and the world came into being. When the people would gather around Abraham and ask him about his pronouncements, he would explain them to each of the individuals according to their understanding. Abraham took great care in making sure that he answered the people's questions until they turned to God. Abraham planted in the people's heart his, this fundamental principle. He also composed text about it and taught it to his son Isaac. Rabbi Meir says, also a good palm, etc. Said Rabbi Hista to Abimi, There is a tradition that the tractate of Bodhazarah of our father Abraham consisted of 400 chapters. Isaac in turn taught this fundamental principle to others and turned their hearts toward God. He also taught this principle to his son Jacob and appointed him to be the teacher and conveyor of the spiritual heritage of Abraham. Jacob also taught his own children the spiritual heritage that came from Abraham. He selected his son Levi and appointed him to be leader and made him the head of the academy to teach the way of God in observance of the mitzvot of Abraham. Rabbi Hama ben Hanina said, Our ancestors were never left without the scholar's council. In Egypt they had the scholar's council, as it is said, Go and gather the elders of Israel together. In the wilderness they had the scholars' councils, as is said, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel. Her father Abraham was an elder, and a member of the scholars' council, as it is said, And Abraham was an elder well stricken in age. Our father Isaac was an elder and a member of the scholars' council, as it is said, And it came to pass when Isaac was an elder. Her father Jacob was an elder and a member of the scholars' council. As it is said, now the eyes of Israel were dim with age. Six precepts were commanded to Adam. The prohibition against worship of false idols. The prohibition against cursing God. The prohibition against murder. The prohibition against incest and adultery. The prohibition against theft. The command to establish laws and courts of justice. These matters remain the same throughout the world until Abraham. When Abraham arose, in addition to these, he was commanded regarding circumcision. He also ordered the morning prayers. Jacob commanded his sons that the leadership should not depart from Levi's descendants in order to maintain the teachings so that they would not be forgotten. This concept gathered strength among the children of Jacob and those who gathered around them until there became a nation which knew God. However, when the children of Jacob extended their stay in Egypt, they learned the deeds of the Egyptians and began worshipping the stars. The only exception was the tribe of Levi, who maintained the mitzvot of the patriarchs. The tribe of Levi never served idols. Within a short period of time, the fundamental principle that Abraham had taught was uprooted 
and the children of Jacob returned to the errors of the world. Since God had chosen the descendants of Abraham as his own people, he caused Moses to become a great prophet and teacher and sent him to redeem the children of Jacob. All the statements made above describe the path of prophecy of all the early and later prophets with the exception of Moses, our teacher, the master of all prophets. What is the difference between Moses' prophecy and that of all the other prophets? Divine insight is bestowed upon all the other prophets in a dream or vision. Moses, our teacher, would prophesy while standing awake, as number 789 states. When Moses came into the tent of meeting to speak to him, he heard the voice speaking to him. After Moses prophesied and God chose Israel as his inheritance, God gave them the entirety of the mitzvot and informed them of the path to serve him. God also informed the children of Jacob as to the judgment prescribed for idol worshippers and all those who stray after idols. Although man can appreciate the futile nature of idol worship and the greatness of God with his own intellect because man is fallible, it is necessary to have these principles institutionalized in an objective, unchanging religious code. In short, the proper Jewish definition of idolatry is to do an act of worship toward any created thing, to believe that a particular created thing is an independent power, or to make something a mediator between ourselves and the Almighty. It is considered a great insult to God to worship one of his creations instead of him or together with him. This is the rule for both Jews and non-Jews. Shalom.